it's always great to come and and be introduced generously, as is usually the case, but I, I'm always in the back of my mind remembering an old Gaelic professor I had in university who warned me that in, in the ancient Celtic tradition, you have to be very careful about uh, where the praise and the flattery comes from because it makes you feel good, but it is also drawing the attention of the evil spirits <laughs> to whatever you're being praised for. And of course, there's an immediate caucus of evil spirits to try and deprive you of uh, whatever advantages you do have. So I come from a community in which you are instructed and, uh, and conditioned early on to take um, praise and, and to take credit with a, with a grain of salt that uh, Phrases, and I'm sure we've all shared this, <clears throat> phrases like being stuck up and big feeling are not exactly labels we want, we want to have. Um, and you learn, coming from that kind of a background, tricks that sort of get you through uh, large crowds. I'm particularly worried about this one because everybody's had a nice lunch and everybody's going to be feeling sleepy. <clears throat> and I and I'm recall remembering that a couple of weeks ago I I talked to St. Mike's High School. They put me in the auditorium and a huge number of boys sitting out in front. And uh, I tried to be interesting, but I halfway through I noticed that I swear half of the boys in the in the crowd were asleep, literally heads back, mouths open. <laughs> this was they weren't even subtle about it. And and I was it, the. The staff was a bit embarrassed and they told me afterwards that I shouldn't take it personally because this was one of those rare occasions when uh, they were listening to an adult talking to them and they didn't have to remember anything. <laughs> they, they didn't have to, uh, to uh, write an exam about it. So if anybody feels the urge to doze off here, there will be no exam questions. And I am very broad-minded about this, this and I won't hold it against anybody. Uh, the other trick I have, I discovered this recently because Punishment is a book about crime, law, and order, serious stuff. Uh, but there's, there's some really romantic stuff in it, too. And, uh, and there's one particular romantic uh, segment that I read now and then. And, and if I'm in a delicate state, I, I sometimes get, you, know, you feel the emotion welling up as you read. And, and I, I, I found a trick. I was in St. John, New Brunswick recently, and there was a big crowd, and I was feeling kind of delicate, and I said, I'm, I'm not going to get through this reading without sort of choking up. And I thought of what I would think of. You've got, you got to put your mind someplace else, and I suddenly started to think of Stephen Harper. <laughs> as soon as I got into the really emotional part, I thought, Stephen Harper. I put him right in the crowd there, and I made it without a, <laughs> without a sniffle. The other thing that keeps you humble, uh, especially when you're visible, I am a visible majority, uh, is the reactions of the public to your persona. Um, I went from being stopped in the street with a finger pointing and saying, you're that guy. You're that guy on TV. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I moved on. I evolved from there to... Um, you're that guy who wrote that book. And uh, one morning uh, in the subway station, I wasn't particularly cheerful, and I said to the guy, what book? <laughs> and he said, you know the one. <laughs> and uh, just to sort of complete the, the trilogy of humility, I was at an airport carousel in Victoria, B.C. about a year and a half ago when I was still in the television racket. Uh, and uh, a young woman, a very attractive woman in her early 20s, comes up to me as I waited for the bags. And she said, excuse me, I don't want to bother you, but I, can I ask you for a favor? And I said, yeah, what favor? <laughs> uh, and she said, um, can I have my picture taken with you? And I said, okay, on one condition. And she got a little bit apprehensive, <laughs> wondering what the condition was going to be. She said, okay, what? And I said, that you know who I am. <laughs> and she looked at me and she says, everybody knows you. You're Lloyd Robertson. 
That is absolute, absolute truth. See, a lot of people in, the, in that world of, of TV and, and visible uh, visibility, they, they don't understand. As I learned growing up in a village uh, with a harsh uh, Gaelic teacher, uh, that uh, being recognized or, or seeming to be familiar isn't the same as being important. Uh, that looking like a comedian doesn't make you funny. Uh, looking like a thinker doesn't make you smart. And a lot of people in that TV business and in the business that sort of gets you recognized, uh, they allow these things to go to their heads. You know, see, this is another one of those phrases that many of us who grew up in small places learn to be very wary about. You let it go to your heads. So a lot of these friends of mine in the media were shocked about a year ago uh, when I told them that I was about to give it up. I was going to step away from all that stuff. Abandon the world of television recognition for a, a more private kind of existence. And uh, they well, why would you do that? And I just said, well, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. It is a bit disorienting to be here talking to a room full of writers and maybe even being listened to <laughs> by a room full of writers. And I just want to talk a little bit about the journey to this room. Uh, it, it began inauspiciously enough in that village, uh, you know, in the two-room school. It, lo it looks great on the, uh, on the resume now, the two-room school. You sort of look how far he's come from the two-room. <laughs> but in the days of the two-room school and, and the, the big rural uh, consolidated high school with 200 people. I mean, the reality of that was, was pretty, uh, was difficult. It, it, it wasn't something that I ever thought I would be in a position to, to brag about. Um, and I, I came away with a pretty indifferent education. And the one thing that I did come away with, and, and, and maybe some of, some of it could be attributed to the schooling was uh, an ambition to become a storyteller. Uh, where I grew up in, in uh, rural Nova Scotia, stories were, were the mainstay of the culture and the social life of the communities. I mean, there were stories on the radio, there were stories in the papers, but the best and most engaging stories were the ones you heard in the kitchen, uh, the ones you heard at the gas station, the post office, the card games, the wakes, and the weddings. Good storytellers were like good musicians. They were very highly valued. Human flaws were forgiven if you could play a tune or tell a story. The worst drunk in the village would land on the doorstep and be admitted if he could bring his fiddle or a story to tell. I had uh, the good fortune when I, when I was in university to study under a, a very gifted teacher and poet and storyteller. He was a priest named Father McSween. We used to call him Father Moonbeam after a uh, cartoon character. But Father Moonbeam deserves a lot of the credit for my transition from the two-room schoolhouse in the village in the kitchen listening to the stories to standing in front of a room full of writers. And the credit he deserves for the way my working life unfolded is not for all the obvious pedagogical reasons that you might think. Because Father McSween let me know very early on in no uncertain terms that I couldn't write worth a damn. <laughs> Certainly not the kind of writing that, that meant anything to him the creative kind of writing, the poetry and the fiction. And he told me why. And the reasons why I couldn't write worth a damn stayed with me because I gritted my teeth and, and I came to the conclusion that he was telling me the truth. He taught me the difference between emotion and sentiment and the importance for a writer of the kind of personal confidence that can only come from knowledge 
of the subject you undertake to write about. And my problem was that I was kind of sentimental and I didn't know anything. And I think those flaws are substantially related, but the combination in my case resulted in a crippling lack of confidence, and as a consequence, I wasn't much of a writer. Because to be a writer, you do have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your craft. And for a very long time, I didn't. So I turned to journalism. <laughs> <laughs> See, in journalism, you have to get to know things in a hurry. You can't avoid knowing what you're writing about. The essence of journalism is in the gathering of information, and you don't have to have a lot of writing talent to tell a story about something you've just listened to or witnessed. Plus, journalism actually makes it possible to earn a living. <laughs> Luckily for my ego, there was another university professor, another priest, who was a sociologist, and he was a little bit more diplomatic than Father Moonbeam. This professor persuaded me that based on essays that I had written for him, I might have a flair that my English teachers hadn't noticed. And so it was to no small degree because of his influence and his encouragement and a nudge from a former newspaper man who was at the university at the time launched me on the road to becoming a reporter. So that's what we used to be called. Uh, now everybody is a journalist, even people who aren't. You have a laptop and a website, you can be a journalist. But back then you had to have other credentials and I was lucky enough to acquire credentials and a job without a whole lot of difficulty. See, the thing about the real practice of journalism is that it required me, in all my lacks, uh, my deficiencies in talent and self-confidence, it required me to quite frequently step out into the heavy traffic of human experience. And I had to be able to adapt and to adapt quickly to situations that I might never have imagined witnessing up close. See, that's what journalism is all really all about. And you have to figure out how to communicate efficiently and clearly what might a few days earlier have been totally mysterious to you. And I eventually found myself in places I'd never ever have considered visiting. Learning about and reporting things I'd probably never ever have chosen to be part of. And in time, you get a, a whole different perspective on history and human nature. And it isn't always possible, but it's never boring, and it's often profoundly revealing. And as long as you're not completely stupid, and you stay at it long enough, you begin to see patterns in human behavior. You begin unconsciously to connect dots between what you learned in school and in literature and in history and what you're seeing going on around you, and you start to draw conclusions. You get big ideas. Journalism isn't always receptive <clears throat> to conclusions and to big ideas. They take up too much time and space, and they can be controversial. Big ideas can get you in trouble. Big ideas, though, stay with us, and for many of us, they keep trying to escape. They keep trying to find some way into the broader conversations about life. I'll give you an example. Covering troubled parts of the world for a number of years left me with two distinct and somewhat contradictory impressions. That people seem to have an irresistible tendency to kill one another, and that human nature is neither good nor bad. We do good things and we do bad things like murdering one another, and murder is bad. But we as individuals, or as a species, are neither good nor bad. Good and evil are adverbs, and it's wrong and unproductive to use them as adjectives. See, that's what I came to believe after a lot of first-hand experience from the practice of journalism. But how do we explain the frequency and the savagery with which we do bad things to one another? According to one statistic that I've tracked down and which I believe to be in the ballpark of accuracy, in the 20th century there were 231 million people who were killed by human decision, not by tsunamis and 
volcanoes, but by human decision, not by accident. Premeditated murder, 231 million. Now in journalism, the big question is always why? Why things happen? Why do people do things like that? And the depressing conclusion I reached as my journalism career evolved, besides the realization that we'll never be able to answer that big question about what causes bad behavior, was that big answers to big questions like why have to come from somewhere else, somewhere other than journalism. Maybe philosophy, maybe religion, or maybe a form of creative speculation called literature. And then I remembered something else I took away from Father McSween's writing class, that the quality of literature is to a great extent based upon the truth that we find in the stories and the poetry that originate in experience and survive as part of our cultural memory. And I decided that maybe I could try to process some of my ideas through the medium of fiction by turning them into stories about people we might be able to recognize as family or friends or neighbors. People who have been directly or indirectly affected by some of those tragic tendencies that come with human nature. So finally, after more than 20 years into a journalism career, I thought that maybe I had learned something worth writing about in a format that might last longer than a term paper or a newscast or even a television documentary. In the profession of journalism, we have a well-used cliche that journalism is the first draft of history. And I thought maybe it's also valid to consider journalism to be the first draft of truth. And maybe it was time for me to get busy on a second draft and a third draft and to recycle some of the important information that I acquired in the heavy traffic of human experience and to refine it as best I could. So much of what we learn in the practice of journalism is collected and communicated on the fly. I used to brag on this Halifax radio station I knew about, first, fast, and factual. And far too much of what we learn, what we get to know, ends up, as they used to say before the digital revolution, on the cutting room floor. And so writing fiction became an extension of the journalism. Rather than just reporting on unusual human experience, I decided I was going to try to explain it by telling stories about recognizable people in common situations. But situations that were shaped by uncommon circumstances we might never understand, we might not ever even know about. Now, people have asked, often asked me if it was difficult wearing two hats, journalism and fiction. And I would always reply, no, not if the stories are about reality. For the storyteller who is rooted in reality, there is really only one hat. About a year ago, I began to take note of the fact that it was becoming increasingly difficult to practice that original storytelling craft, journalism, the way I was taught that it should be done. You know, getting the resources and the time to venture off into the world and gather the essential facts and context to communicate that first draft of whatever we want to call it, history or truth. Journalism had entered a period of crisis. There has been a revolution in technology, and partly as a result of that, the business model has for some time now been breaking down. Information has become instantly accessible. No more waiting for the arrival of the morning paper or the news at 10 o'clock. Today, we carry the medium for instant access to the news in our jacket pockets, at our individual disposal, 24 hours a day. But here's the problem. People now have access to all the information that they want, when they want it, without paying for it. But where, if fewer and fewer people are willing to pay for it, is the information going to come from in the first place? There's unlimited technological access to the product. But what about the cost of the production? We still need people to go to the places to see and to record what's going on. We still need people to go out and 
get other people to tell them what's going on, to ask the questions necessary to get the answers and the information that will help us to understand the world. And see, this is where the problem lies. That process costs a lot of money. But the business doesn't generate the kind of money that proprietors require to justify their investment and their costs. So they do what owners and proprietors always do. They cut costs. And when businesses cut costs, they invariably cut people. And in the inf information media, this usually means getting rid of the people who go to where the stories are, who ask the questions and bring back or send back the information. And so we have a very dangerous trend evolving. A lot of opinion, even comedy, disguised as information. A lot of propaganda delivered by institutions and governments who want to put their self-interested spin on the reporting of what they do and to present it to the public as objective truth, which it hardly ever is. News and commentary are increasingly dominated by advocacy and by advertising, all cleverly designed to seem truthful and objective. But a lot of what we're getting through the media is designed not for enlightenment, but for entertainment and for persuasion by special interests. And there's nothing wrong with that, except that when persuasion becomes the dominant design of com information, communication becomes an exercise in propaganda, or what it really is, brainwashing. So I'm going to resist the temptation to turn this in, into a political speech. <laughs> as ready as I am to give one, but it's the middle of the day and I haven't had anything to drink. <laughs> but sufficient to say that about a year ago I, I came to the reluctant conclusion that my days in journalism were coming to an end. The private sector media is being crippled by economics and the public sector media is being crippled by politics. It was an epiphany that came to me quite appropriately in a television studio. I was listening to a panel of CBC big shots trying to explain how they were going to deal with continuing budget cuts by eliminating 576 jobs right away and over the coming years, a thousand more, at least. Now this comes after decades of budget cutting and layoffs that have severely, severely compromised the ability of the CBC to function. And the worst part of the job cuts is that they basically penalize the youngest and the brightest and the most vulnerable employees. People with the talent and the kind of potential any organization needs to realistically plan for a healthy future. See, this is what the CBC is losing, the future. In a later conversation with a boss, I wondered what would happen if the CBC started targeting old-timers like me. Now, I was assured, oh, this will never happen. For one thing, the politicians and the senior managers don't want the public to notice what's going on. People might notice if they got rid of me. Good point, I thought. Maybe it's time for people to notice. And to make a very long story that was painful at the time, but a year has passed. But to make it shorter, I decided to make a statement with my feet. I decided to leave, and on the way out the door, I decided I was gonna say why. I was gonna say that I was leaving because the CBC is being starved to death by politicians who would prefer to dominate the newspapers and the airwaves with propaganda. I got an awful lot of attention, a lot of undeserved attention, I'll say. Because to be realistic, you know, I was at a point in, in my career, my life, where I could draw a pension. I knew that I was starting to become stale. I'd used up whatever potential I might once have had to grow as a reporter. And I had, through stubborn persistence, established myself in a broader and more durable kind of storytelling, writing fiction. What I did might have saved a couple of jobs for a while, but it also made a lot of sense for me. Now, I don't know what, if any, impact my decision had on the CBC, but it did seem to register with the general public in a visceral way, a way that I hadn't expected, because it turned out that there are many, many people concerned with things like getting their careers started, 
Many, many people concerned about the possibility that the whole notion of career may be passe, trying to get jobs while old timers like me sit on top of the jobs that young people should perhaps be getting more access to. And at the other end of the spectrum, I realized that a whole lot more people like me are wondering when their working lives should end, when they should step aside and make room for all the bright young people who are lined up eager to do our jobs. Young people with an asset that the old timers don't have anymore, the potential to improve, to grow, and to adapt to the challenges of an overwhelming world. So I moved on, and people noticed, and I'm always surprised to hear people still talking about it. People ask me how I'm enjoying retirement, and I say, I didn't retire. <laughs> I just quit. And I decided to do my storytelling in a larger and hopefully more lasting medium. I was recently at a, at a public library talking about the book, the punishment book. Um, it's a book that was based on an awful lot of uh, journalistic experience. And, uh, and I was telling the folks, it was a big crowd, it was amazing the numbers of people who come out to libraries to hear people talk about books. But anyway, there was a big crowd there, and I was telling them, you know, this, this book is based on what I learned as a reporter. And as a reporter, uh, I ended up in an awful lot of penitentiaries. Uh, I never really expected to be in the penitentiary, but boy, that's where I spent a lot of time. Uh, in jails and prisons from old Dorchester Pen in New Brunswick, Rwanda the, after, the, after the genocide, uh, packed prisons full of genocide air, uh, to uh, death row in Texas, uh, lovely William Head in British Columbia where I would happily do time. I learned more in those penitentiaries than I could ever communicate through the medium of journalism. And the people who taught me a lot about crime and punishment and justice were the convicts. And it was from the convicts that I learned that there really are no bad people, just pathetic people who from time to time, and for reasons that are very complex and mysterious, do bad things. So what do you do with that, that kind of insight? Some time ago, it occurred to me that this is what books are for, elaboration on things we learn by living. And for me, telling stories either in big books or in, in those little machines that we carry in our pockets was a way of living large. Journalism got me into the penitentiary and helped me to get to know a lot of interesting people. But the books, the books enabled me to get the ideas out and uh, to allow other people to vicariously live the experiences that I discovered. I guess that was the most important thing that I learned growing up in a simpler time and place. People are interesting and they're never more interesting than when they're in trouble. They're never more interesting than when they're responding to a crisis or to events that strip them down to the fundamentals that define what we call character. Circumstances that impose another standard that we hear a lot about these days, authenticity. And I learned growing up in the village and in the wider world of journalism that if knowledge is a precondition for writing, the keys to self-knowledge lie in the experience and the lives of other people. Old reporters love quotes, and there's one that I carry around with me all the time. It's from the great biologist and thinker, Edward O. Wilson. It's a call by Wilson to keep on learning, never stop learning, a reminder that learning is a yearning that should never end, and he promises this. When we have unified enough certain knowledge we will understand who we are and why we are here. If those committed to that quest fail, they will be forgiven. When lost, they will find another way. The moral imperative of humanism is the endeavor alone, whether successful or not, provided the effort is honorable and the failure memorable. <laughs> Words for writers to live by, and thank you very much.